To begin with, you will need to measure about four centimeters of magnesium ribbon and to sand it over a paper towel. Don't do this directly on the counter or you could uh, damage the counter. You can see here the difference between the unsanded and the sanded. Um, so you should have something that is quite a bit shinier. You may not be able to get it quite this shiny, um, but you want to get it as shiny as possible. Take the mass of your magnesium ribbon. It needs to weigh less than 0.04 grams, so you'll need to use the analytical balance to get a very precise measurement of the magnesium ribbon so that you have more than one significant figure. We need the mass to find the moles of magnesium, which in turn will help us to find the moles of hydrogen gas produced. You'll have several inches of copper wire. I have put one end through the end of the stopper to kind of hold it in place so that I don't lose track of my magnesium once I've inserted it in the udiometer. I'm next going to wrap the magnesium ribbon around the other end of the wire and then wrap the copper wire around the magnesium ribbon like a cage. I have the udiometer so that the numbers are reading upside down and clamped into a burette clamp. You will notice that as I get all the way to the bottom, I am measuring from the bottom how many milliliters there are. And I'm going to add 10 milliliters of the hydrochloric acid. Use a funnel when pouring into the udiometer, just like you would a burette. It's easy to overshoot your mark in the udiometer, so you may wish to measure into a graduated cylinder at first and then pour it into the udiometer. The exact amount isn't important. Next, you will add 50 milliliters of tap water plus a little extra, bringing it right up to the brim. Some will spill out as you add your magnesium, and this is okay. When you add the magnesium to the diluted hydrochloric acid in the udiometer, you will find that the reaction will begin right away. So you want to make sure that you have your large beaker with water ready to go. We want to invert very quickly, and then after we invert, insert it directly into the glass beaker to ensure that any bubbles that are formed stay in the udiometer and any displacement occurs into the water that will offer some reverse pressure. You may notice some turbidity in the udiometer as the hydrochloric acid drips down from the top. It's a little bit more dense than the water and then it will come down and reach the magnesium strip and the magnesium strip will begin to form some bubbles. Recall that at this point, the pressure inside the udiometer is separate from the pressure outside the udiometer, and they are not equal to one another. So we're going to have to move the udiometer to a place where the water outside can reach the same level as inside the tube so we can accurately read the volume inside. Inside this bucket of water, the water level within the udiometer and the water level of the bucket can be equivalent to one another. And this means that the pressures both inside and outside are equal to one another. So by knowing atmospheric pressure, we know the pressure inside, and we can determine the volume based on where, this, uh, where the volume is at this pressure. You will need to measure the volume on your udiometer, and you will measure that volume similar to how you do a burette from the top down. So this one looks like it is almost 37, but really closer to 36.9, but I need two numbers after the decimal. Barometer is read at the top of the mercury meniscus. It is marked in centimeters, but recorded in millimeters. The total pressure inside the udiometer is made up of both the hydrogen and water vapor, but we are interested only in the partial pressure of hydrogen, so we'll use this formula to solve for that. You will need to look up the temperature of the recorded experiment on a table of water vapor pressures. Use this for pH2O. Plug in the atmospheric pressure on the left and the table number for water vapor pressure on the right and solve for the partial pressure of hydrogen. It is important to keep in mind that our end goal is solving for the value of the gas constant R. 
so you need to rearrange the equation. You also need to make sure that you have all of your units in the appropriate form in order to solve for the gas law. So you should turn your pressure into atmospheres, your volume into liters, and your temperature into Kelvin. Some example numbers are shown here, but you will use the numbers provided to you by lab below. Plug your numbers back into your rearranged equation, making sure that you do both trials before ending the experiment.